Battlecast Prime Time. The stage is set, and now it's time for Red Alert 3 to make its debut on the PlayStation 3. Senior Development Director David Seeholzer breaks down the PS3 Ultimate Edition and why you'll be glad you waited. On the PC side of things, see who's joining Gemma and Ivana in a little uprising and find out what's got the entire cast going. Woo! Battlecast Prime Time starts now. You're logged in to Battlecast Primetime. Happy New Year, everyone! Still recovering from a little too much New Year's cheer is my co-host, Raj Joshi. I'm David Silverman. That's right, David. 2009 has only just begun, and already the CNC team has started shaking things up with some pretty heavy announcements. Well, Raj, we have two new titles headed your way in the upcoming months. We'll have more on Red Alert 3 Ultimate Edition later, but for now, let's dive into Uprising. Amir Jami made headlines on January 8th when he went on Battlecast Primetime and revealed the first details about Red Alert's newest expansion, Uprising. Here's what senior producer Amir Jami had to say about the upcoming campaign expansion. My name is Amir Jami and I'm the senior producer on CNC Red Alert 3 Uprising. Uprising is the campaign expansion to Command & Conquer Red Alert 3. We listened to our fans. They wanted more story, more skirmish, and more campaigns, and that's exactly what we're giving them in Uprising. It adds four new mini campaigns, a bunch of new units, and this great new mode called Commander's Challenge. Just like Red Alert 3, you'll be able to play as the Allies, the Soviets, and the Empire of the Rising Sun. But we're also including a new campaign that focuses just on Yuriko, how she came to be, and how she got her powers. Uh, Commander's Challenge is this great new mode that is a lot like world domination. Uh, there's about 50 of these missions in all. You start out with a very limited tech tree, and as you beat certain commanders, you get access to their units. You essentially steal their tech, and you can, in the next mission, then use their units kind of against them. Uh, and we also time the players, so it's one thing to actually just finish this mode, but it's another to finish it under our par time. Of course, it's, uh, it's a CNC game, and it would not be a CNC game without uh, live action cinematics. A return of old, as well as uh, introducing some new characters. For the Soviet, Ivana Milosevic reprises her role as Dasha. Gemma Atkinson makes a return also for the Allies. One of my favorites, one of the biggest names that we have in Uprising is Malcolm McDowell, who plays the role of EU President Rupert Thornley. Ric Flair uh, does make an appearance in Uprising. He plays the role of Commander Hill, who is this general that's a lot like Patton, very in your face, very gruff. It's really an extension of the story from Red Alert 3, so we wanted to give fans of, of that story, of that fiction, uh, more to play with. But we haven't forgotten about our multiplayer base. In the very near future, we're going to be releasing a bunch of new multiplayer maps just for them. Myself, as well as the whole team, have put a lot of effort into Uprising. Uh, this is one of the best expansion packs that we've ever done, and we think that fans of the series will think so as well. And we can't wait for this game to get in their hands. Sony recently announced that they have sold 19.5 million PlayStation 3s. That's 19.5 million people who have something to be excited about this March when Red Alert 3 rolls into town. Here to walk us through the PS3 Ultimate Edition of Red Alert 3 is a new face to Command & Conquer TV, Senior Development Director David Seeholzer. David has been with EA for six years and it's time to get to know both him and the PS3 version a little bit better as we meet and ask a developer. Hi, I'm David C. Holzer. I'm a Senior Development Director here at EA Los Angeles and working on the PlayStation 3 Ultimate Edition of Red Alert 3. Well, the job of a development director is to manage the project, so I need to make sure that the work that we're doing is resulting in something that looks great, sounds great, and is fun to play. I'm an old-timer, so I've been doing this since 1988. Um, my first game was Arkanoid, which is a far cry from Red Alert 3. We've been working here in Los Angeles for years now on adapting RTS to a console. With Red Alert 3, the radial interface has taken another step forward. We are finding that uh, players can play the game quite effectively, get into the depth 
of controlling the RTS gate with a controller. The PS3 Ultimate Edition of Red Alert 3 goes well beyond its predecessors. Much higher resolution for a much more polished look. The game includes five new skirmish maps that weren't in the Xbox 360 edition. One of the nice things about the PlayStation 3 is that it has a Blu-ray disc with a very large capacity, and so we're taking advantage of that. We have uh, bloopers and outtakes uh, behind the scenes, very famous Women of Red Alert 3 video, uh, nice retrospective on the art direction, and to help get our players up to speed playing the game, we have an exclusive edition of Command School made specifically for the PS3. We have the entire audio soundtrack included with the game. The videos have been remixed for the Blu-ray version. As anxious as the fans have been to see this on the PlayStation 3, we have been just as anxious to get it there. Overall, this game lets you get much deeper into the Red Alert 3 universe. Thanks, David. Needless to say, your team has done a phenomenal job with the PS3 version, and come this March, everyone will realize why EA decided to call it the Ultimate Edition. When we return, we bring you face to metal face with the Giga Fortress from Red Alert 3 Uprising. APOC comes out of hibernation and makes his 2009 debut, and we score the exclusive in-studio interview with The Nature Boy when Battlecast Primetime continues on Command & Conquer TV. Welcome back to Battlecast Primetime. I'm Roz Joshi. Still up, we get an inside look at the Empire of the Rising Sun's colossal base-cracking unit, the Giga Fortress. But for now, it's time for the Battlecast 5. 5. Foxbox, as the Empire, squares off against Oreb's allies on industrial strength. Foxbox rushes the map with dojo cores, quickly garrisoning nearly every structure on the map. Mine, 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 mine! His path cleared of all resistance, Fox sends his MCV to the front, setting up two more dojos just outside of Orb's base. Can't get enough of those dojos, huh? The heat is on, and Orb's airbase strategy just isn't working out for him, so he takes to the street. A few Riptides manage to clear the first wave of dudes, but not so fast. Foxbox still has his MCV, and the Riptides get ground up in Conyard tank dreads. Now defenseless, Orb can only watch as the second wave of infantry raise his base and put him out of his misery. Joza as the Empire squares off against Doom Boy as the Soviets on Fire Island. Joza rushes center field with two dojo cores. That doesn't even kind of work, and he's forced to fall back to a more standard Tengu strategy. The fight is on. Doom Boy pushes forward but is beaten by some careful Empire micro. The Empire's choppers take to the sky, knocking the Soviets out of the space race for good by demolishing the airfield and Conyard. Doom Boy reacts with flak troopers and bullfrogs, but is out microed again. Both players fall back to lick their wounds before clashing in the middle for some good old fashioned CNC tank bounce. The Soviet advance succeeds in taking out an Empire's ore collector, but Joseph returns a favor with the fleet of Tengus. And that, my friends, is a turn of the tide. 
Final squadrons rain down hell and infantry tank skirmishes get bigger and better, but Doomboy just doesn't have the green to keep it up. Joseph's money and Micro win the day. Three. It's Cos vs. Krunk in a classic Soviet Allied Cold War matchup on Snowplow. An early infantry swarm from Koss lays waste to Krunk's fledgling base, putting the Allies at a serious resource disadvantage early on. Fearing retaliation, Koss sends his conyard to the high seas, quickly taking up to Tier 3 and producing a couple of deadly dreadnoughts. But Krunk has a naval strat of his own, and those Soviet behemoths meet their match at the hands of some assault destroyers, which are then quickly gobbled up by Koss's magnetic satellite. Krunk, at the brink of defeat, with no land base in sight, decides to throw in all his credits behind a Shamu spam! Yes, I know, Shamu's a whale, but go with me here. The army of Shamu's lay total waste to Koss's sea expansion, and not even the Soviet Conyard gets out of this one alive. Unable to build another MCV and stuck with only a barracks to take down Krunk's sea-based expansion, Koss goes for sneaky engineer rush, and it works! Koss takes the naval yard and pumps out a flipper of his own. Unfortunately, the dreaded Shamu swarm is still lurking nearby, and they decide to nibble on that naval yard, taking him out of the game. Unable to produce any units capable of destroying Krunk's last structure, Koss has no choice but to throw in the towel, or, uh, snorkel. Maestro's allies and Psychoxnik as the Soviets buckle down for an epic arms race on industrial strength. Ten minutes into the match, there's not a war factory in sight, but the sky is filled with MiGs and Apollos that battle it out for supremacy. Wait, what's that? A bird? A plane? No! It's Tanya called in for backup for the Allies! Boom boom, baby! Two super reactors and the entire Soviet land base go up in flames. But the water's warm and Psychoxnik settles down for a nice long bubble bath. Maestro takes over the former Soviet motherland for some extra income and demolishes yet another super reactor with the cryocopter time bomb combo. But Psychoxnik just doesn't give a crap. Tesla coils start popping out of the ground like weeds in a garden and in a few minutes both players MCVs are reduced to piles of rubble. As the game crosses the 30 minute mark, 30 minutes, we see our first dreadnought which winds up as an ice cube at the bottom of the sea. But that's just the start of it. Psychoxnik rains down an unholy apocalypse of superpowers including magnetic singularity, orbital drop, and magnetic satellite. While Maestro's economy is in shambles, Psychoxnik is cranking out another MCV. And finally, when his air force falls to a fleet of bullfrogs for the umpteenth bazillion time, Maestro throws in the towel, a whopping 42 minutes and 20 seconds into the match. Woohoo! Foxbox returns! Teaming up with Boom against Mitchell and Maniac on Hostile Hostile. Foxbox uses patented Dojo Core Rush technique to set up three dojos right in Mitch's base, swarming his early structures and forcing the allied player to take to the water. Dive! 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 But Foxbox's ally is in trouble. Maniac rushes to an armor facility and has tanks in Boom's base before he can even build a second refinery. Boom barely escapes with his MCV and stays hidden away for the rest of the match, letting Foxbox do the dirty work. With a few captured allied structures, Fox mixes and matches and sends a tank buster IFV rush to Maniac's undefended base, tearing it to shreds. Someone watched Monday's Command School episode. Mitch tries to make a play to get back on land, but those tank busters are there to greet him and give him the kiss goodnight, forcing Maniac to do his best Celine Dion impression and be all by himself. The IFVs clear out any resistance on land, and one lonely riptide finally layeth the smacketh down on Maniac's sea expansion. With no hope in sight, it's GG and a win for Foxbox and Boom. Raj, I guess I have to. Boom, boom, baby, boom, boom! And there's your five for this month. The five. Brought to you by the ATI Radeon 4870X2, the fastest graphics card alive. Who was your favorite player in this month's Battlecast 5? Head on over to commandandconquer.com and vote for your champion in our online poll. The top two will square off in next month's main event. One of the advantages of being the official source for all things Command & Conquer is that we get to give you the exclusive access to the latest news. Back in December, EA filmed the cinematics for Red Alert 3 Uprising, and I had the privilege to sit down with the world wrestling sensation, Ric Flair. Some of you may recognize him from his illustrious wrestling career. Others might know him for throwing down the figure four leg lock on other wrestling sensations such as The Rock, 
Hulk Hogan, and the mighty Stone Cold Steve Austin. Whatever the case may be, you're all going to be knowing who this man is when you play Command & Conquer Red Alert 3's campaign expansion. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the man, the myth, the legend, the 16-time heavyweight champion of the world, the Nature Boy, Ric Flair. Thank you. Rick, uh, welcome to Battlecast Prime Thank Primetime. you. Honored to be here. Now, Rick. Obviously, you know, you've had a very impressive wrestling career over the past 30 years. You've also done other wrestling video games, you've done TV, you've done movies. But this is your first time in the campaign expansion for Red Alert 3, where you're actually acting in a video game. Yeah, I'm honored. It's great. It's, uh, you know, post wrestling is uh, something I've been thinking about and working on for a long time. And uh, you have you guys call me, make me part of this, I'm very thrilled about. Now, in the game, you play a Commander Hill. Can you give us a little bit uh, more insight of who he is? Well, Commander Hill is a. Uh, I guess a retired veteran that's looking at the war from the outside. He sees everything from a different perspective. He's old school, he's mean, he's tough. He doesn't like the liberals running the army right now. He's gonna make a scene. He's gonna be aggressive, hard, tough, that's me. Old school man. Did you draw any inspiration from any, you know, either other actors or other historical figures to come up with Commander Hill? Ah, uh, General Patton. He led his troops the way he thought they should be led. And he uh, went to war, he thought the way the war should be um, handled. And, you know, ultimately he was successful. He was not very popular, but he was successful. Now, Rick, you know, obviously you're, you're well known for your both in the ring exploits and your out of the ring kind of antics. So what can you tell us about, you know, working with all the beautiful women in Red Alert 3? Well, I'm really excited about it. All I can say about Ric Flair and Space Mountain, okay? Oldest ride, longest line, all night long. What's the origin behind, woo? The origin is that uh, Ric Flair was driving on the road in 1974 and he, Turned on Jerry Lewis and he was taking great balls of fire. Recognized the gracious, great balls of fire. Woo! And I said, I'm gonna attach that to Ric Flair. The rest is history. But since Jerry Lee has only acknowledged that a couple times, I take actual credit for the woo. Nice. Given, given it is true, true, true do right there. All right. <laughs> well, there you go. The Nature Boy, Ric Flair. Thanks, Thank man. you so much. Thanks, guys. You have no chance against the Nature Boy and Commander Hill on Red Alert 3. Woo! Red Alert 3 Uprising boasts some pretty epic units for all three of the factions. One unit in particular is generating a lot of headlines. The Empire's Giga Fortress. What is a Giga Fortress? Where did it come from? Why does it look like it's smiling at me? <laughs> well, let's go under the hood in Birth of a Unit. My name is Mike Collins. I'm one of the art directors on Command & Conquer Red Alert 3 Uprising. I art direct all the uh, new units in the game. We start with the document from the designers and we kind of gather reference material on some of their ideas and some of the uh, art department's ideas. Get something that we know is going to serve the gameplay really well but also look really cool and be fun. So the uh, Giga Fortress just began as a boat that could fly over land. We wanted a boat that was so large that it didn't need to turn so we came up with this kind of uh, lotus flower design and it has a uh, multiple rocket launcher so it can take out all aircraft that are coming in and then just has all these cool deck guns on each flower petal so it can just bombard artillery. So a secondary ability is this big transformation where the flower petals all fold up and he flies up into the sky, this big head with a giant laser cannon in his mouth. Basically vomit death into your base. So it took us a lot of tries to get the Giga Fortress right. We actually had uh, two concept artists working on it, one on the boat form and one on the floating head. We brought in a lot of elements of Japanese samurai armor. They have a lot of demon heads on their armor and the helmets and the shoulder pads. The reaction of the team, they were kind of really doubtful at first. They were kind of thrown by having this giant head in the game. But once they saw the concept art, they were really sold on it. So I finally saw it in game, really proud of all the work everyone's done. The Giga Forge is just one of many awesome new units in the game, and we can't wait to get it in the player's hands. Like the Sasquatch, Abominable Snowman, or Loch Ness Monster, Ooh. APOC has been hiding for several months now. Well, the time has finally come for APOC to emerge from his corner. And tell us if we can expect six more weeks of winter. Hey, what's up all you Command & Conquerors? This is Aaron A. Pock Kaufman, your official CNC Community Manager. Back in my corner, really excited for what promises to be a fantastic 2009 for the CNC Community and all CNC fans around the world. Let's get started. Well, unless your internet connection zapped out, you've undoubtedly heard about the stellar cast that's gonna be played in Red Alert 3 Uprising. And what does that mean, CNC fans? It's time for character profiles. They're back and better than ever, starring Ric Flair, Malcolm McDowell, and the beautiful Jody Lynn. Get the latest wallpapers, videos, and a whole lot more. Well, I know Sean Teeter is salivating at this opportunity. We've got the very first 1v1 tournament for Red Alert 3, 
It's being hosted by our friends at EVGA. Registration for this single elimination unlimited entry tournament is going on right now at EVGA.com slash Red Alert 3. The tournament begins in early February, and if you win, you might win an awesome GTX 260. The great way to uplift those graphics in Red Alert 3. Voting for the 2008 ModDB Awards has begun right now at ModDB.com, and eight of your favorite CNC mods have been nominated. First nominations for Command & Conquer General Zero Hour, we have CNC Shockwave, Cold War Crisis, and Rise of the Reds. Next up for the favorite, Tiberium Wars, we have the old time past, Tiberian Dawn, and the upcoming fan favorite, Midi's Crisis 2. And how can we forget some of those stand-up renegade indies? First up, we've got Red Alert 2, Apocalypse Rising, CNC Reborn, and the everlasting Red Alert, A Path Beyond. Congratulations to all the mods that have been nominated. We wish you the best of luck. CNC community, get out there and vote and show ModDB who's boss. Well, it's great to be back in my corner, everyone. Happy 2009. Back to you, Dave and Raj. So, uh, APOC, do you happen to see your shadow? Come on, Raj. I freaking hate you guys. Oh, uh, APOC, you know we love you, right? On deck, it's throwdown time for the undefeated ladder season champion, Sean I Train Harder Teeter. Did he train hard enough to beat the devs best? Find out when we return to Battlecast Primetime on Command and Conquer TV. By now, you may have heard the stories of Yuriko Omega, the mysterious Japanese girl with the terrifying psionic powers. Yuriko, wake up. You must break free of this place. Welcome back, Commander. Show no mercy. Kill them all. You must stop them, or our future will be extinguished. Our first concern right now is finding the terrorist who perpetrated this cowardly attack. Good luck out there. And I'm going to cheat you all about defeat. On the main event. He's beaten everyone in the community in both CNC3 and Kane's Wrath, but does Sean Teeter have what it takes to defeat EALA's best in Red Alert 3? This is the main event. Welcome to the main event. Back in October of last year, EALA hosted its own internal Red Alert 3 tournament to see who would take home the crown. Everyone involved in the project competed in a single elimination tournament, but in the end, it was a final matchup between CNC TV's own Jeremy Fiesel and the QA lead, Mike Umbau. The best of three series went 1-1, and it was all decided on the final match in Snowplow. Mike O's allies took on Fiesel and the Soviets for the tournament championship. Fiesel's commies struck first, rushing the map with terror drones and amassing a small sickle army. Unfortunately, Fiesel went all in and left a back door wide open for Mike O to set up shop on the ridge above. Fiesel, determined to take back the ridge, continued to throw everything he had at Mike, but it all turned out to be a big diversion for... an engineer rush! Fiesel's MCV, gone. Fiesel's refineries, gone. Fiesel's chances of winning the tournament, gone. Well, at least we have Fiesel here to commentate now. Well, these past three months, Mike O's been sitting pretty, knowing that he's the best ELA has to offer. But is that enough for him to emerge victorious in this toughest match to date? 
You know, Raj, for more insight, let's kick it over to our experts, Greg Black and Jeremy Fiesel. Gentlemen, welcome back to Battlecast Primetime. Happy New Year. It's uh, great to be back uh, here in 09, and I'd like to welcome back Jeremy Fiesel, who did an excellent job with Kane's Wrath Ladder Championship commentary. He's going to be uh, commentating the main event. Thanks, Greg. It's great to be back in another great championship match. All right, now that we're all warm and fuzzy, uh, what do you guys think you expect to see here today? It's Ali Tobey game, so I'd expect lots of uh, Jumanji spam early on. What is Jumanji spam besides a bad movie with Robin Williams? Dogs and bears, you know, fighting for the scouting <laughs> battle. I don't know. Uh, what do you think, Jeremy? Well, you know, Teeter is really, really good with those infantry tactics. We saw him in Kane's Wrath, constantly using the missile squads, the rocket squads to take out even larger groups of his opponent's tanks. He loves infantry. I'm going to go with you on this one and say he's probably going to go infantry. While Umbau is really, really awesome at coming up with these map-specific, even sneaky strategies that completely throw his opponent off base. So then do you think he stands a chance against uh, Sean Teeter? Yeah, I really think he does. I've seen Mike play, and I've seen him practicing up for this event. I think he's going to go and really show us something interesting. <laughs> you actually were in the Super Bowl uh, against Mike Umbau, and you uh, kind of got slaughtered a little bit. Yeah, kind of. Well, I mean, it was two to one, so it wasn't as much of a slaughter. But yeah, Mike, Mike is a really, really great player. Even if he doesn't win, he's probably going to knock him for a loop. The pressure is, you know, huge being a game designer going up against someone from the community. You know, what do you think is at stake? What do you think Umbao is going through? Is he, like, freaking out here? I mean, you mentioned he's practicing, Jeremy. Is he like, oh, my God, the whole studio depends on me to win? I certainly hope so, because, I mean, he will get nonstop ribbing from us if he loses. So he better win. All right, guys. Well, let's take a look at the map they'll be squaring off on with some battleground reconnaissance. Secret Shrine is one of the most diverse maps in Red Alert 3. Players starting ore nodes are in vulnerable positions, so beware of the early rush. A series of islands connected by bridges create multiple attack routes as well as shipping lanes for naval assaults. Garrisonable buildings all over the land routes make the trek across the map a dangerous one, so many players will focus on air power. Four ore nodes on the corners of the map provide room for aggressive expansion. Watch your back and best of luck. All right, now we know who and where. Let's get the what and why. Time to put our reputations on the line in our pick of the match. Great. Who are you going with? Got to go with Teeter, man. The community always wins. All right. Jeremy, you going to go with your uh, all-time rival, or uh, are you going to change it up a little bit? Well, you know, having played against Mike during the Dev Team Championships, watching him practice, you can see that he's really got a lot of these strategies in his head. I think he can pull out an early game victory on this one, and I'm willing to stake my claim on him. Well, Raj Joshi, this is your chance to start 2009 with the correct pick. What's it going to be? Oh, the pressure. Ah, uh, you know, I love Sean Teeter. He has not uh, not done badly for himself, but I got to go with the home team. That's right, my goal oh, is my pick. Right. Well, he hasn't steered me wrong yet, and I've already made the sign. Oh, yes, it's, where is it? It's Tina time. What's more, Tina time in the city. <laughs> Seriously, Silverman, I thought you'd be different in 2009. Why? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. Anyway, it's time to get this show on the road. Enough with the pleasantries. Gentlemen, let the games begin. Tonight's matchup is between EALA reigning champion Mike and CNC community undefeated ladder season champion Sean Cheetah in Secret Tribes. Beasel, set the stage. Well, here we've got uh, Sean Teeter up in the north playing as the Soviets. You can see he's already got that barracks out. Greg Black, you called it. Jumanji spam. We're going to see some bears here pretty soon heading down towards that allies base. So obviously the, the flak troopers and the bears, excellent micromanaged units. They can take out incredible amounts of units if you micro them well. And we know Sean Teeter loves his APMs. Ooh, Ooh well, that, that was interesting. Surveillance sweep coming from Mike O down in the south. So the fact that he's gone surveillance sweep and he used it this early is actually kind of a bad thing for Mike. He's told uh, he's told Teeter that he hasn't gone advanced aeronautics. Yep. Therefore, he's obviously not going with an air strategy because getting advanced aeronautics really helps your air units. And what? we can see that he's gone for the naval strategy rather than the air strategy. Not really something that we see all that much in competitive play, and we know those are the things that Maiko loves to do. And he's this got, map has tons of water on it. Right. right. And directly between hey, both look, player bases, he's got a dolphin out. A he's going to that jump it over this bridge. Oh, hey, that was cool. Yeah. You can't see that in SeaWorld. And that allows him to take it over to his opponent's or node over here, but you can see that Teeter has seen this coming. He's already almost got a defensive turret up there, and that dolphin just can't quite get around that shoreline. See, there's no uh, Yeah, already. this is this is crazy. So, uh, I'm bound forego the barracks, went straight to the uh, naval yard, tacked it up to tier two, and now is rushing with assault assurance, which is something I don't think I've ever seen. 
I think this is definitely a first time. Hey, Greg, when are you gonna when are you gonna buff those assault destroyers? Next next patch, three hundred dollars cheaper. And uh, oh, you, know, you ran over the harvester. You run right over harvester with them. Now this is a uh, this is pretty scary. Except the terror drone is just gonna completely counter What's that the, uh, assault, field assault, over the assault destroyer. Uh, if anything was shooting at anything other than the assault destroyer, all the uh, shells would be redirected into the assault destroyer. So he's getting a little armor boost, but. See, this is the problem with not mixing your units. If he had had one Riptide, he would have been able to take out those uh, Terror Drones and that uh, Assault Destroyer could be just wreaking havoc. Was there any advantage for him getting out there that early and not waiting until he had the right support? You know, really, I think against a Soviet player with the quick access to those uh, Terror Drones, it would have made more sense to wait the extra, you know, 10 or 20 seconds to get a couple of uh, Riptides. To See, I don't know, he was able to take out that Harvester, though, he would have been which able gave to him do a pretty anyway, good advantage. And there we go, another Terror Drone managed to sneak in there. Um, That's just bad micromanagement yeah, bad on Mike's micro part. He should have uh, had those Riptides really focusing on guarding so he's gonna make that Assault Destroyer. Thing's gone. It's going to be close, but he, he should be able to make it. Unfortunately, I mean, this is the time he's going to lose. You think this is more of a mental match that's going on right here, that Maiko is kind of freaking out knowing that Sean so, Teeter is... Definitely. Right. I think that early game Dolphin thing failed, and then the first Assault Destroyer failed, and now Mike is freaking out. Yeah, my, Mike is really good at coming up with these uh, creative uh, rushes, but if they don't work, a lot of times he doesn't have anything to follow them up with. We saw this in, in the game that you won against them. Mm -hmm. And here, Mike has seen that his opponent's probably going to be coming with that big force of ground units. He's preemptively destroyed his bridges, trying to buy himself a little bit of time, come up with a counter strategy. Ooh, and Teeter, realizing this, is using some excellent powers. And you can see in this particular case that Mike hasn't placed his uh, his refinery very well, so he's behind even more on income than what he was before. Looking back at the very early of the game, I noticed that there was a bear sitting there. Teeter probably had left it there the entire right. game and forced Mike to build his uh, refinery in an odd place. It's pretty it, smart. It doesn't really work against Japan, of course, because the eggs can crush. But mm -hmm. against um, you know allies or so. It's definitely good. And good here we're plan. seeing some twin blades. No, no uh, anti-air. Yeah. Not really seeing the <laughs> level of uh, level of unit mixing you would expect at uh, high level play. It really right. feels like he kind of committed to an initial strategy and is not really advancing much past that. I don't think he's really reacting to what Sean is doing. Sean's trying new strategies. He went with the infantry, didn't work, going to air now, and uh, I'm about a little engine that could keep on pushing, but no. But again, he's just... gone through that, that channel like 10 times now. So now, let me ask you this question. And because... this is at the, hang on one second, at the oh, bottom please. left of the map, a Approaching Mike Umbau's base, Teeter has expanded forward and thrown up, uh, it's like a, war factory. Up a war factory, a proxy war factory right in front of Mike Umbau's base. I think we're going to see something really nasty end to this game. So Teeter is just kind of cleaning up here. Isn't yeah, it? I mean, this is this is GG. We, the the Conyard was just taken out by the uh, Apocalypse tanks. They're about to eat that war factory for lunch. There's nothing Mike can do here. He was just outclassed. So really slowly grinding his way through that base, and he's still got an enormous air army. What do you mean he's going through his head right now? Um, GG. Yeah. <laughs> he's going, oh! I think he's about to yank the network cable. Yes. <laughs> oh! Yeah, there we go. That's a good game. Congratulations, Sean Teeter, for an amazing win. Teeter time, ladies and gentlemen. Teeter time. What's Guess hold Saturday? up the sign. Guess hold up the Sean sign. Sean Teeter, the man is a command and conquer god. Well, that's all the time we have for you this month. Be sure to stay glued to www.commandandconquer.com for all the latest on Uprising and the Red Alert 3 PlayStation 3 Ultimate Edition, which features an all-new Battlecast Primetime Rush and a PlayStation 3 Exclusive Edition of Command School. Also, don't forget to Battlecast your next match for Shopping Featured here on Battlecast Primetime. For Greg Black, Jeremy Fiesel, Roz Joshi, I'm David Silverman, and we'll see you on the battlefield. I'm Tiger Guys, Brown G. Brown Guys.